a lot of it was a feeling of inadequacy. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was, you know, I still remember Kevin Durant's special on HBO and he started it off and he goes, I've come in second place my entire life. And that's what I felt. Like, now this was before, you know, mm -hmm. he was second in MVP. He was yeah. second overall drafted. Yeah. But, you know, that's how I felt my entire life. That, that chip on my shoulder that I've, I felt like I've come in second and that eats away at me. Mental health Monday. Mental health Monday. Mental health Monday. My mom and dad, they were both in the police force in Jamaica before moving over to this okay. side. Okay. So when they came over here, they were really big on you don't have to do anything in the military, especially when we've moved to America for you to have different opportunities. I think that's 100% correct. But, like, don't ever forget who you are and where you've come from. Because, right. like, the Jamaican family, you inherit the values of the island, whether you were born there or not, and that's how you move in life. Yeah, in and, and the military is by far not the only way to serve. Yeah. You know, but people don't tell, people don't tell war stories anymore because they're just happy to get through it. Yeah, yeah. And then um, I think with more information that's coming out, from my point of view as a citizen, you tend to realize that a lot of these wars, a lot of these moments, stuff that's happened prior to 9-11 and after 9-11, unfortunately, war has become this brand machine where the truth kind of gets lost in what was the cause and effect. And I mean, you as a history major, 100%. I know that's major. And now you have all this emotion that's destroy, destroy. And not as much, hey, how do we move past the death and the people that have been lost and work on what does community actually look like between the people in the military and the people not in the military and the understanding of how much of this is actually necessary and why. And, and we're seeing that overseas right now. Yeah. You can't measure spitefulness. Right. And well said. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, when you think about a lot of the messed up things, like, being in IT, I listen to a lot of channels about hack stories, and the reason I do that is if you work in IT, especially when it comes to cloud architecture, at some point, your system's going to get got, whether it's in a database or it's in the cloud. That's just how it is. Yep. And what it comes down to is your job is to recognize when something is off and what it's looked like in other people's careers. Right. And how do you as a company and you as a team adapt to that quickly? Because recognition is probably going to be one of your greatest weapons, especially as someone that in everyone's life, you're not going to be able to experience everything. So right. you need to take it in as you can from the perspective right. of other people who've handled it. Right. So for you, when it's come to mental health and you picked up on recognizing things were off, what did that time look like for you? You know, if you if you talk to my mom, mm -hmm. it would have started when I was younger. And you know, it, it's interesting because I recognize it in my nephew. I recognize yeah. it in one of my nephews, which, uh, which scares me because I don't want to see him go through the things that I went through. Um, you know, the depression, anxiety really kicked in mm -hmm. more in college. Um, and then after college, things kind of like, things kind of calmed down. And then a lot of it was a feeling of inadequacy. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was, you know, I still remember Kevin Durant's special on HBO and he started it off and he goes, I've come in second place my entire life. And that's what I felt. Like, now, this was before, you know, mm -hmm. he was second in MVP. He was yeah. second overall drafted. Yeah. But, you know, that's how I felt my entire life. That that chip on my shoulder that I've I felt like I've come in second and that eats away at me. And then, you know, as we talked before i had you know september 30th of 2018 i collapsed i went to a bar hadn't had a drink hadn't even ordered a drink i remember grabbing a pretzel bite mm -hmm. and i fell down and i fractured four bones in my skull and had two brain hemorrhages one in the front one in the back mm -hmm. so i was in a coma for five days and then i was i was out for a month and my buddy BK um, 
put me back together like RoboCop. So I thought physically, if I was physically okay, that's fine. So I started going to see a therapist at the urging of my, my girlfriend at the time and my family. And, you know, I have no ego when it comes to that stuff. It, it was, all right, if I can be better, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, um, and I still remember calling my sister a year later after, or a year later I, I started therapy, I called her and I said, hey, Lauren, what was I like the past year? And um, she broke down crying and, she, and she's not like that at all. And she said, Brad, we were, we've been wanting you to ask this question, but we were so scared because you might flip. Like, I wasn't physically getting into altercations with folks, but I was just like, I was sharp with people. I was short with people. Mm -hmm. Even my dad, my dad is the nicest guy in the world. And, um, you know, I told my sister a couple years ago, maybe a year ago, I said, I don't think I ever told you what my motivation was to get better. I said, it was your nephew, it was your son's because my nephews are gonna go through hard times and I couldn't have them see someone give up. And, and some of those times, you know, effectively what happened was I was dating a woman for five years and I fucked up. I, I thought I needed a change in life before I was starting to see a therapist and I, uh, I broke up with her and I can still feel that fire on my face. Of, of that conversation I still go back to it November 17th I still remember it every year and uh, you know I I made that mistake thinking that I needed to make a change and I made a big mistake in about three weeks later asking another woman out now I did it out of loneliness I was almost not there I was I was almost on the verge and, um, you know, I had, we were, I was out with a buddy of mine and a few other people going ax throwing. And I had gotten this call. He was in Syria at the time and he called me and he's like, Hey, I know you're moving out. I need a place to live. I'm gone for three months. I'm home for a month. I'll split the rent with you. And I'm sitting there 35 years old, not wanting a roommate, had a, had a two bedroom because I could afford it and uh, he pushed me hard to to live with me and I I was reticent to do it and finally said okay sounds good so about a year later we're all out axe throwing and I'm making a joke about how Kalani needed to live with me at the time and he uh, he pulled me aside and he's a quiet guy he's one of the only people I know in my entire life who knows a lot about a lot and he's got a very interesting job. He's ex-Special Forces, and now he does work with the State Department. And um, he said to me, he goes, I don't think I ever told you why I moved in with you. And I'm like, yeah, you needed a place to live. And he goes, no. He goes, I saw what was going on with you in talking to you. And he goes, I didn't think I'd have you by the end of the year. And I... Uh, it was the first person to call me out on something that was probably true. And, you know, so I asked this woman out and she ended up being a therapist and I still feel bad to this day because I basically used her. Like I basically, she was my lifeline. You know, it was like my dog and like her, like I needed to get better. And in those three weeks in between breaking up and taking her out, I put it this way, whether it was suicidal thoughts, I didn't want to be me anymore. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to be me. And whatever it took to do that, the darkness came in and I was like, yeah, yeah. Like if this, if this is the way it's gotta be, yeah. this is the way it's gonna be.